uh, support vector machines, or I think as Justin called them, support vector machinations, um, <laughs> but we'll stick with the machines, I guess, for official purposes. So learning objectives, which I hope to cover today, implement a binary classification model using a maximal margin classifier, do the same using a support vector classifier, and then finally using a support vector machine. And then we kind of we want to talk a little bit as well, although the book didn't go into a lot of details on this, maybe there will be more in the lab about the multi class cases. Uh, the three first points have to do with um, binary again binary cases so two two uh, two options two classes. Okay, so. Before we kind of go any further, we, let's talk about the concept of a hyperplane. So a hyperplane would be a P minus one dimensional flat subspace of a P dimensional space. So the example that was given in a two dimensional space, a hyperplane would be a flat one dimensional space, AKA a line. So you can see a um, little bit different than the Y equals MXB, but that equation there on the second bullet point is basically using variable X1, X2 um, is the equation of a line. And it is set equal to zero, which for reasons which will become clear a little bit in a little bit. So any x such that x is equals x1, x2 is transposed gets to be column vectors for which the equation above is satisfied is a point on the hyperplane. Okay, so now we have a the concept of a hyperplane. Let's think about classification. So consider a matrix X dimension N times P. So N observations, um, P columns, features. Um, so a given Y sub I is a member of the set, either negative one or one. So we have a new observation X star, um, which is a vector X star equals, you know, X star sub one up to X star sub P. So think about that. And, and then we want to classify that to one of two groups. So we use that separating hyperplane. You can think of that as a line if it's helpful to think about it in two dimensions to classify the observation. Okay, so I've chose um, this figure, figure nine two from the book because I thought it was a really helpful visual. So you could see these two classes of observations, blue and purple, um, or pink looks like to me, but whatever, um, each of which has measurements on two variables. So X1 and X2, those different. So we, um, we want to, uh, we have three separating hyperplanes on the left, which all of those could possibly separate these training observations. Um, and then on the right, we see one of those, um, the one with the smallest slope and magnitude is shown. So, the, the grid is that decision rule, right? So based on that particular separating hyperplane. So if the test observation, that X star, falls in the blue part of the grid, that's going to be in the blue class. And then the pink or purple part, it'll be assigned to the purple class. So going a little bit more into that plus one, negative one, um, just for this example, the blue observations could be Y sub I equals one, pink, pink observations, y sub i negative one. So the separating hyperplane have the properties such that if that hyperplane, imagine it goes up to p, right? Obviously, we just have two, two variables in, in the figure. If it's greater than zero, if y sub i equals one, and then that is less than zero if y sub i equals negative one. So again, then think about multiplying that y sub i um, versus, uh, so plus one, negative one, right? So basically it's the magnitude, right, of that beta zero equation is greater than zero for all i sub i equals n, except for, of course, if you're on the hyperplane. So consider the magnitude of f of x sub star. So if it's far from zero, we're very confident in its classification. If it's closer to zero, right? So if it's located near the hyperplane, we're a little bit less confident. So we kind of, that brings us into the idea of margin. Uh, before I go any further, any questions, comments? Okay, well then I'll talk at once. <laughs>
uh, maximal margin classifiers. So the first of our learning objectives. So generally, if a data can be perfectly separate using a hyperplane, an infinite amount of such kinds of hyperplanes exist. So intuitively, and they don't really, I don't think they go into a lot of the mathematics behind this, but if you think about it, I guess, making sense, um, maximal margin hyperplanes. That's the hyperplane with, that is farthest from the training data, right? Because we want to be confident in our classification versus if we have a lot of observations that are right up next to that hyperplane, we're going to be less confident that we correctly classify them. So uh, we compute the perpendicular distance. So um, I'm going to go back really quick. So imagine like this distance here, right, right angle going going there. I guess this one is probably a better one to use. So we compute the perpendicular distance from each training observation of the hyperplane. So the smallest of those distances is known as the margin. Um, so the maximal margin hyperplane, that's the hyperplane for which the margin is maximized, as you would guess by the name. So we can classify a new observation, x sub star, based on which side of the maximal margin hyperplane it lies on. And this, um, this classification method is known as maximal margin and classifier. So another way to think about that is we classify x sub star based on the sign, positive or negative, of that um, equation that we saw earlier. Okay, so I guess I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. So you can kind of see um, in figure 9-3, you see uh, the, well, this is the margin, which I did not mention earlier when I was looking at figure 9-2. You can see these dotted lines right over the margin. Um, we can have that blue and purple uh, observations. The hyperplane itself is the solid line. So the margin is a distance to either the dashed lines. So the, the two, blue points and the purple point, um, there's only one purple point that lies on the dashed lines are called the support vectors. And again, you might think, well, it's a dot. So think about this as basically this is, is in P, you know, dimensional space, right? So there's, it's a vector essentially, even if it looks like just a dot, which I guess a dot would be a vector in a plane, right? Two dimensions. But um, the distance from those points to the hyperplane is indicated by the arrows. So that's that perpendicular uh, distance. So the blue, again, the blue and purple grid are, are basically the decision rule, right? Uh, I, I was thinking about this. I don't know if the, I don't think the book discussed this, but I convinced myself, I think, that at least in two dimensions, you, know, you will in general have three of those support vectors. You could have possibly have more. But I That's think, an interesting thought. Yeah, I had. I don't think they did touch on that. I'd be curious maybe to hear more your... in higher dimensions. I mean, if you if you think about sort of wiggling, like um, so you think about an expandable like a stick that can get fatter or narrower, and you can wiggle it around, you know, and you want to get it as fat as possible, and you stick the stick in all these pins, and at the point where you can't move it anymore, it's got to have at least three pins kind of supporting it, pinning it in place, right? Because if there's only two, then you can you can you can loosen it up and expand it a bit more. I mean, I, I managed to convince myself sort of that sort of analogy that you have that well, first, because I was first looking at this, I'm like, well, isn't that a little random? They just have like, they just happen to have three points right on the line there, like why three? But I think in two dimensions, it will almost always be exactly three that you, you touch because at that point, it's like the stick is stuck. It can't wiggle. It can't get any bigger in any direction. I like the almost hedge there. Well, you could have four. You could have four. Like that would okay. be really rare. It's like it's like a stool. A three-legged stool will always, you know, all three legs will touch the ground, and a four-legged stool might be have to be really, really lucky for that fourth leg also to touch. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thought, Jonathan. If you have, um, if you find something like online that kind of, I can see where you're coming from, that would delineate that, right? I would be if you, yeah, I'd be interested to see that, like read an article about that. Um, yeah, I mean, if you find something, please share with uh, with us, or you can put it in the chat or on the Slack channel. Yeah, let me just see if there's a, something quick. I'm I don't, I'm not sure exactly how this would generalize, like you know, three, four more dimensions, but I think it probably grows linearly. I don't know. <laughs> I will only be satisfied if you do a simulation, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
we want to see like and we want to see like really cool like mathematica you know like the I mean, is, calculus is, class like the cool little i guess I mean, you could do all that in r than simulation <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to keep moving on. And Jonathan, feel free to jump in again if you think of something and you want to share that with everybody. So, okay, so speaking of the three, three training observations, right? Um, P equals two, kind of what we were just talking about, although not. So they support the hyperplane because if their location was changed, the hyperplane would change, right? That slope in this case gets the line. Um, so maximal marginal hyperplane depends on these observations, but not the others. Um, and that they kind of, there's a little bit of hand waviness about this in the book, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's been a couple of days since I was combing over the chapter. Obviously, if you moved one of the other observations within the margin, well, that would, that would uh, affect it. But okay, I think that's everything on that page. So the mathematics behind the maximal margin classifier, or here after known as the MMC, if I'm not fe feeling like saying the whole three words. Okay, so consider constructing a, an MMC based on the training observations, X1 to Xn, a member of the real p-dimensional space, right? Of the p-dimensional space of real numbers. So this is, we, got, we have an optimization problem here. Um, so you're maximizing M margin, right? And then there's all those parameters, beta zero, beta naught, basically M. Um, so that's subject to, so you're summing up all of those betas from J equals one to P, the square, I'm sorry, the squared of the betas, those are equal, to the, those are constrained to be equal to one. And then you want that Y sub I times that whole plane or whatever we want to think, hyperplane, right? Equation, so remember we saw that earlier, to be greater than or equal to M for all, you know, all observations, I one to equal M. So betas are chosen to maximize M. The, the third um, equation constraint, right? So it ensures that each observation will be cor correctly classified as long as M is positive. Um, so basically greater than zero. Um, so the second and third equations ensure that each data point is on the correct side of the hyperplane at least m distance away from the hyperplane. Um, and then the perpendicular distance is given by, right, that y sub i beta, beta naught, the hyperplane equation. Any questions or comments about any of this? Okay. So moving on um, to objective two, I believe it is, support vector classifiers. So the examples we've seen before have been kind of nice because you can kind of draw that hyperplane, right? And it's like, oh yeah, like they're definitely separable and all, and all of that. But we can't always use a hyperplane to separate two classes. Um, even if such a classifier does exist, there's always the possibility for overfitting, right? Um, too much sensitivity to individual observations. So we might want to consider a classifier slash hyperplane that misclassifies a few observations in order to improve the classification of the remaining data points. So support vector classifier is also called the soft margin classifier. Um, so it will it allows basically for some of your training data to be on the wrong side of the margin or even on the wrong side of the hyperplane. Okay, so again, kind of, this is gonna look very familiar to what we just saw a couple minutes ago, right? With a couple extra um, constraints. So we're maximizing that margin, right? Subject to the same, you know, squared of the beta is equal to one. We want that to be greater than or equal to M. Like, so for this time it's one minus epsilon. So epsilons um, are the slack variables. Uh, when I first saw that, I was like error. But I guess you could think of an error. I mean, maybe there's a reason because an error is sort of a slack variable. If you think about it, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm overthinking that. They allow individual observations to be on the wrong side of the margin or the hyperplane. So epsilon sub i indicates basically where the ith observation out of one to n is located with regards to the margin and hyperplane. And then you'll notice the, um, I should have put more space in there. I might edit that for readability in the, the fourth line. Um, so you have 
a budget, which is C, right? That's a tuning parameter often chosen through cross-validation. I'm sure when we go through the lab, there will be something related to that. So it's your, it's your basically your budget for margin violation. So it's saying, okay, we can have some margin violation, but we're going to decide how strict we want to be and how many observations can, can, vi can violate the margin and by like how much essentially. So if epsilon sub i equals zero, the observation is on the correct side of the margin. So if it's greater than zero, it's on the wrong side of the margin. It's greater than one, oops, typo there. I'll just correct that before I open the pull request. It is on the wrong side of the hyperplane. Um, since C, so C constraints to mention some other epsilons, so it determines the number of magnitude. So if C equals zero, basically there's no margin for violation. So essentially that's kind of what we were just looking at, right? With this marks, maximal margin classifier. So note that if you think about it, if C is greater than zero, no more than C observations can be on the wrong side of the hyperplane. So if the, in these cases, epsilon sub i is greater than one. Any questions about this? Kind of a mouthful, I guess, for comments. Okay. Well, if you think of something, do jump, do jump in. Okay, so here, this is a nice little visual illustration of the support vector classifier. So we have um, basically different uh, hyperplanes, right, with different different margin, different tolerance for having, you know, um, observations on the wrong side of the hyperplane. So we kind of go from most permissive, right, to like most narrow, and you can see that the hyperplane is changing in terms of that, that slope as well. So I think the, um, the caption is helpful. We're using different values of Cs that affects the hyperplane's largest value, of course, is in top left, and then we get smaller as we go. So, you know, C is large, observations, more tolerance for viol violating the margin. Um, again, kind of going back to the whole support vector data point or observations, probably be a better way to say it. Only observations which lie or on or violate the margin will affect the hyperplane, All right? So here we have a lot of ones that are affecting it. And then we kind of get less and less as we go. So C, going back to the bias variance trade-off, right? C is basically controlling that bias variance trade-off of the classifier. So when C is large, right? You got a large budget. Um, Oh, wait, I already went through that. Blah, 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 blah. Yes, yeah, so that is basically high bias. So I'm going to scroll up again. Low variance, right? That's up here. So when the C is small, and that's the bottom, right? We're going to have a low bias and high variance classifiers. So there's a low number of support vectors, right, involved in determining. So theoretically, if you had another point here, right? Or some, you could change. You had an, you could change the it would be very more sensitive to to that new point given there are fewer points, fewer observations. Excuse me, involved. I have a I have a question. Sure. Really, uh, isn't it isn't it seem kind of weird to? So I understand how shrinking C or setting C to be low makes that line more sensitive to like the local points. And that's one mm -hmm. of the things that we talk about when we talk about bias, bias variance trade-off is that, you know, how local, uh, how sensitive the local changes is the function that we fit. But, you know, in this case, it's always a line, right? So I know we're going to talk about, or maybe uh, the radial kernels and then like quadratic stuff, uh, expanding the feature space. Mm. But in this case, like just switching, like changing C, it seems like it's a different kind of uh, bias. Like shrinking C, I understand in one way how that reduces bias. Or oh, sorry, shrinking C, yeah. Sh shrinking C reduces bias and increases variance. But I don't know, does it seem immediately intuitive to everyone else that it's just, I think I'm just stuck on like, it's still a line. Like, you know, because when we talk about it in the linear case, right, we add, quadratic terms and stuff to make lines squiggly or, uh, or use splines. But in this case, it's always a line. 
I think, and that's the thing that I still haven't wrapped my head around as far as bias, bias, variance, trade-off, and uh, C and port vector machines. Yeah, those are, those are good thoughts. Anyone have any comments they want to share about that? I mean, it's, it is still a line, but you can have lines with lower bias or higher mm -hmm. bias, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would think so, yeah. I'm far out of my element here, but I think, Justin, the one thing to keep in mind with this is it's only vectors. Vectors will always be lines. There won't be any sort of quadratic anything to it. Um, does that, so we're trying to find the, the, the best point and then set parameters around that, uh, the distance. Um, so while you were talking, I got stuck on a thought. If you always remember that y equals mx plus b to get your slope formula, blah, blah, blah. And I'm being very, very uh, uh, naive or, or elementary with my comment here. The measurement perpendicular to that slope will always be the distance that we're trying to measure here. So your, your, your spaces between that, the C that we're referring to is just the distance between those two points. The mm -hmm. reason I'm, I'm wanting to jump into the conversation is, is because this is always going to be a vector, it will always be a straight line regardless. Um, now that straight line may shift, the slope of that line may shift, but it will always be that straight line. Does that help at all? Well, I think it, you, <laughs> yes. Uh, in my mind, you kind of reformulated my point is that it's always a straight line. So okay. that, that's what I mean. And so yeah, use a counterexample. Or the way I'm thinking about this is that uh, so expanding C means that more points determine the line, right? And mm -hmm. I just, so to use two other examples where we've dealt with this before, we've had uh, K nearest neighbors. And what happens there when you let more points determine a line is that the line becomes straighter. It goes from squigglier to straighter as you have more neighbors. Okay, there's one. And there's also low S progression. There, there's a parameter that determines what portion of the data set determines that line. And as you let more data determine that line, it becomes straighter, it becomes squigglier. So there's the interesting case here where uh, the line is always straight. So you let more data determine the line, it's just a straight. So that's, that's the thing is that in every other case where we've let more data I mean, I, I wonder if that's just because that's this is the we're constraining ourselves right to some kind of hyperplane. So maybe that's just this is the this method, right? And the no, only no, no, sorry, I'm this. This is the last thing I'm gonna say because I really don't want to get bogged down. It's just to me, it's like it's like an interesting thing. Is all I'm trying to say is that in every other case, as we let more data determine the line, it becomes less flexible. In this case, we predetermine how flexible it is in a way, which is exactly what you say. In Ryan, and then it's just like the line changes. Man, I don't know. I, I maybe I should so, understand this myself. I'm just being no, it's a good question. I mean, you, you're bringing up a good point. The way I kind of think about it is those dotted lines, those margins, right? However narrow or far away they are, to determine those the you know hyperplane. So the more we open it up, the more we're going to like if you know if I imagine that like this is how much vertical like distance I'm allowed. So it is kind of like, an, I guess it's kind of like the, the interesting part of optimization problems is like, because everything, it's all part of like a system of equations in a way, it's like, it all is connected. And I'm saying this to a very lay person, kind of the way I think about it. But yeah, I mean, I just think it's like, okay, well, however many points you allow to determine the line, you're going to get a different slope. And that's kind of how I think about it. That's probably too simplistic, and maybe I'm missing something. Okay, well, I think those were um, very good discussions. So, if anybody has any thoughts, we can. I think we're going to have enough time easily to get through everything, so we can certainly come back and talk about that. So, yeah. So, um, just I think it was in the second to last point here. This is a property of, of the SVC is that solely being dependent on certain observations, right? To determine how the classifier um, is calculated. 
differs from other classifications such as linear discriminant analysis. So that depends on the mean of all observations in each class, as well as each class's covariance matrix using all observations. So it's been a few chapters since we looked at that. So we are not, then the last point, logistic regression is actually more similar to SVC. So it has a low sensitivity to observations far from the decision boundary. If you've read the chapter, I think it's, it's 9.5. It's the last section, which I did not, I don't have a slide or two about it today, just because it wasn't in the learning objectives. And I was going to try to get through more material. And I figured, well, y'all can read that yourself. But it's, um, it's kind of interesting to see how, how they are similar. I definitely recommend you take a look at that. OK, so now we're kind of coming to the meat and potatoes, I guess, of this chapter, support vector machines. So surprise, surprise, many decision boundaries are not linear. So thinking about like a quadratic uh, uh, situation, you got P features, right? You're using, so then you'd have like two P features. You can see how that can get big very quickly. Um, I'm going to be honest. So I was sitting there and I was thinking, okay, I could do the LaTeX for this, but it's very similar with a little bit more terms, right? So go to th page 380, take a look at equations. Perhaps future cohorts will decide they want to put all this in, in this guide, but not me today. <laughs> um, note that in the enlarged feature space, so basically you've got the quadratic terms, right? So the decision boundary is, is linear. This was interesting to me and maybe not super intuitive. Maybe I haven't thought about it enough. So the original feature space, it's quadratic. So I guess that kind of makes sense if you're thinking about it, right? You have an enlarged feature space will be linear, but the original feature space is clearly not. Um, so again, you set that equal to zero because we have those plus one, minus one. And generally the solutions are not linear. I guess there could theoretically be a, a time where they would be linear if you have a lot of coefficients that on the quadratic terms that are zero, um, but in general, it's not linear. Now you don't just, you have to stop at quadratic, right? You could theoretically do higher degree polynomials, interaction terms. Um, you can imagine the feature space could grow very quickly and before long your computations are quite unmanageable. Okay, so the SVM is an extension of the SVC. So that results from using kernels to enlarge the feature space. And this was interesting for me, I guess I'm not up to date on such things. I was like, I've heard the term kernels a lot, but really never kind of thought about, looked it up and really, really said, okay, what is this? Um, so basically it's a function that quantifies the similarity of two data points, um, kind of as opposed to thinking of the distance, although I guess those are opposite sides of the coin, right? So we basically, what we're doing with support vector machines is we're enlarging the feature space. So we wanna make use of a lot nonlinear decision boundary. But we also want to kind of avoid that um, unmanageable calculations conundrum that, that can happen when we just start throwing in quadratic and other polynomial and interaction terms. So an interesting, it's a little bit hand wavy in the book. Um, I'm assuming in the elements book, they probably go into this more in terms of deriving it. So the solution to the SVC problem that basically that the math, the optimization problem we saw earlier in this context, while it's only the inner products, which is my memory serves right, dot products of the observations. So um, the notation right for dot product below x sub i, x sub not i, essentially is that that dash on the on the i. Which, by the way, I don't like that notation. It sometimes kind of weirds me out. Maybe maybe it's just me. Um, so basically, you sum that up over for across the across the feature space, right? The p-dimensional feature space and you get your, your dot product or your inner product. So in the context of SVM, right, that f of x that we saw earlier, it's basically that beta, beta naught, and then you add up, you have all those inner products, right, for a, a given an, an x vector across the observations, and you have an alpha sub i parameter as well. So sort of a, analogous, like a slope parameter, I suppose. I haven't really thought about it that deeply. Okay, so to estimate the n, the alphas, 
um, it was a different alpha, right, for each each observation. Um, excuse me, Laura. In sure. Teaching that, okay, that, so now, like, that you are multiplying. I'm, 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 I'm having a really hard time hearing you, Federica. There's some uh, so some TV uh, or radio in your background. Um, yeah. Um, so um, is that that we are multiplying a vector x to a matrix? So it's a dot product, right, of the vector. Are you talking about the? Okay, I'm so I feel like I'm still have a little bit of a hard time hearing. Um, yeah. So the f of x, right? You're having your dot product across for like a given across the observation. Um, I'm sorry, across the observation. So i equals to n, right, for f of x. Up here, you have j equals one. So it's like for a given observation, right? You're multiplying by the other observation, the ones that are not i. And you're summing across all the feature space. So um, yeah, I mean it's kind of I you you have to have a pretty good understanding, I think, of like what's going on in terms of matrix algebra here or matrix matrices. Uh, does that answer your question? The challenge yes, is yes. Uh, it's just a, you have a matrix of x, matrix. x and you multiply yes, the matrix for a vector of x. Another with, with different indexes. So you, you multiply a vector for a matrix. Yeah. Yes, I think I've had a little bit of a hard time hearing you again. Um, so yeah, you're you're so the dot product is basically like so up here it's across, it's for a given observation, right? And you're doing across that that feature space. So it's basically the dot product of an I and then not I, right? So there's gonna be n choose two so to look at look at the set the point below right so n choose two is combinations right between the pairs of training observations because obviously it doesn't matter the order so you're going to be doing that kind of across um all the pairs of training observations i don't know if that answers your question uh perhaps i'm not explaining it clearly Okay, well, I'll move on. And if you think of something else or anybody thinks of something, we can uh, go back to that. Okay, so compute f of x for a new point x, right? So you need your inner product between the new point and the training observations, right? So that's that x and then x sub i up to n. However, alpha sub i equals zero for all points that are not inner within the margin, right? So that's where that comes, basically the, the points of the, they're not support vectors. So that means that we can rewrite the equation as follows. So S is a set of support point indices. Um, so it might be a few, it might be a many, right? So I is a member of S, um, as many as that is. And then you're doing that dot product, right? Um, across, and then those alpha sub i's, right, would be not zero. So how do we go to the to a kernel function, right? So this was, this was kind of, I had to really kind of make sure I was following along with what the authors were saying. So replace every inner product with the kernel, a kernel function essentially of x sub i and then x sub not i. So you're gonna know this n choose two um, of those. And so you're going to say, okay, the kernel of x sub i, x sub not i is from j equals one up to p, right? So kind of going back up to that, basically up to here. So that's the so that is like the support vector classifier. So this is a linear kernel because it's linear in the features. So you could also have kernel functions of the polynomial form, as you can see down here, right? Raised to the power d. And as you can imagine, right, this will lead to a lot more flexible decision boundary. So it's basically fitting a vector support vector classifier in a higher dimensional space um, instead of the original feature space. So when you combine um, Basically, an SVC with a nonlinear kernel as above, you get the support vector machine, right? So we have we're kind of bringing bringing in this piece, right? Bringing in this piece, then we course the beta naught. That was a lot. Um, any comments, questions, corrections? Okay, moving on. Radial kernels. So Justin may mention these earlier, right? So 
besides polynomial, you can have other kinds of nonlinear, right, kernel functions. Popular one is the radial kernel. Um, and then, so basically you have E raised to the power of essentially your um, X sub I over a non X sub I. So it's kind of like, I think of it as uh, differences between right observations across, for, across given feature space and you square that. So gamma is a positive constant. Um, so if you have a given observation X sub star, X star, so if it's far from X, a given X sub I, then the kernel function, right, will be small. And that's because gamma is positive. And then if you, if you have the negative sign, right? So basically, if you have, an, if you have a, a negative gamma and then a large piece of, you know, summation with a P up to the P of all those differences in observations, right? That's going to mean a very small number. So that would mean yeah, that in that uh, case... Uh, sorry, but can, can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, sure. Uh, what part? Um, I think can can you can you scroll a bit down, further down? Okay, here the 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 last formulation. You think you I think you 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 miss an alpha. Uh, I don't think so, right? Because um, this is I'll I'll go take a look and check. I might be you might be right. Right, because, because the kernel function would encode that, right? Um, allora, secondo le keys, according because to the, the keys, kernel function is, is the xx, uh, the sum of the xx, so the, the inner product, and then you still miss the coefficients. So you have a beta, beta zero, and in, in the, here okay, they are uh, alpha. Got to that one yeah, one I don't, like I said, I don't think, I don't think I'm missing an alpha. I will oh, go back and yeah. check. No, because I, will I, I was, check it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, because I was looking at beta zero and I thought, where's the beta one or beta i or whatever it is. Then I, I thought that that was the kernel. You missed something, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll go back and I can go and check afterwards and see if I did. It's certainly possible that I did miss something, but uh, thanks for, for calling my attention to that. I see it somewhat in the chat. Okay, John says it does still, 9.23 does still have the alpha. Thanks, John, for confirming that. So I will make sure we make a note of that real quick. Okay. So where was I? Okay, Federica, could you could you turn off your could you mute yourself, please? Thank you. Okay, so um, let's see. X sub i will play a little little role, right, in f of x of star, given that it's far, you know, it's far away from x sub i. So the predicted class for x star is based on the sign of f of x of star, right? That we got that goes back to the hyperplane. Um, training observations far from a given test point will play little role in determining the label for a new observation. So yeah, basically, maybe a little pedantic of me. Um, sure. The when it has little role. Right? At some point, it's a negligible role, and I think that's the where the, the thrust here is. It says like you get local behavior because it really only depends on nearby observations. I'm just wondering if there's a way of that they of of kind of saying, okay, this is a little enough role that we just ignore it. Like, you know, the exponential there, it mm -hmm. drops to zero pretty fast, but at some point do we just say, okay, now it's zero, right? Like points far enough away rather than, I mean, it's, it's kind of a pedantic question in some ways, like how, how close do they need to be for it to not be little? How far away does it need to be before we just cut it off? Does it, is that addressed anywhere? I forget. I don't think so. I mean, I guess I'm trying to remember the exponential function, right? So it, it, it's asymptotically, right, approaching zero. It's like a, the bell curve, right? You think that this mm -hmm. tail, if they drop to zero. Yeah, so I mean, it's, go, they go on theoretically, forever. it's not yeah, it's zero, technically. Zero. So perhaps, I mean, if you want me to change it to negligible, I can No, 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 no. I mean, it's <laughs> absolutely right. I'm just wondering, um, like, if in a, and maybe this is jumping ahead a little bit, but you know, like when we get to, we, we only need to consider 
the support vectors, the points that are close enough that they don't play a little role? Is there, is there a rule for deciding like, okay, it's far enough away that we'll just assume, let's approximate the kernel at that distance to zero? I don't think they directly address that in the book. Um, I have to go back and, and look at it in terms of, I mean, obviously with a support vector machine, if it's outside of the, uh, right, the, whole, the classifier itself is determined by the support vectors, right? So you have a new X star that is maybe, you know, not in, so it's I'm trying to, I'm just thinking through this out loud, it's not in within the margin or the hyper, plane or you know it's not even transversing the hyperplane so i mean i guess that it, it kind of depends on the x star is maybe where it comes down to but i haven't really had time to kind of think think through the implications of it to be honest okay well let's move on okay so radial kernels continue so this is polynomial kernel degree three. So kind of think about this, like I guess in three-dimensional, maybe three space, non-linear non -linear data, right? I think it makes a little bit intuitively more sense. So you've kind of got like two, <laughs> two, I mean, obviously they're not linear, right? But it's like the hyperplane exists in two different regions, I guess, of this X1, X2 space. You have these different margins. Um, so this is within the margin here and there. Um, and then this is kind of interesting to me. So I'm curious to hear other people's thoughts about like how to interpret this, right? So we have this rate, this is the radial kernel. And then you have presumably like, right, this is one, this is the margin, right? And that's the margin too. So anything I suppose inside, right? Theoretically inside this would be pink. So how do, like, conceptually, I'm curious to put this to the group, like, how do you think about these margins in terms of, like, okay, what's... Is the concept of a margin, though, the same here? Because it's it, kind of going back to another question, exponential has an infinite range. So it's not like there's mm -hmm. a, it's not like there's a, an actual margin. It's more of the, I, I understood this as kind of like a topographical map, and that's just a sort of arbitrary. Yeah, no, I think that's kind of what you have to think about it as, as well as the, when you're not dealing with like a linear boundary. I've just tried to like actually think, okay, this is a, which one like, you know, is a support vector, right? And obviously if it's within the margin, so within the margin, right? And obviously, or on the margin, it would be. So I'm trying to think, okay, we have, yeah, maybe my color perception is very good. So we have blue all around here, pink in here, I think. I'm trying to see those colors on my screen well. And then we have some kind of circular margin here and like kind of a, I don't know what that is, some sort of circular-ish shape margin there, right? So I'm trying to think, okay, which would be like the this the support vectors essentially that's i guess it's kind of going back to my question previously i don't really think they are margins in the same sense and that's where i was wondering like where do we cut it off and decide what the support vectors are when the radial kernel has a technically infinite range like are they all now support mm -hmm. vectors i think everything not in the circles is the support vectors so almost everything okay i think that's what we're seeing but I mean, the circles are kind of then drawn arbitrarily. That that would correspond to you know putting a cutoff on that exponential range. Thing anything beyond this is basically zero. Yeah, I I interpreted this as sort of but arbitrary I, that, contours for visualization, but I don't know. That's true. I mean, it's hard to say how much they're simplifying, right? Not to mention you have a finite range of your observations, so that would probably play some role in it. I would think, right? Because a line could go on infinitely, like depending on as long, you know, I guess if you think about it, right, in either direction, unless you're thinking about like a line segment, depending on the input values, right? So, I mean, you have a, a finite range of values for for your observations. I don't know. Well, uh, isn't always dealing with grouping. Basically, you, you are something grouping the observation following some uh, characteristics, and then you're moving 
those things because you uh, you know you you adapt the thing to new observations and then this is the so the margin and the is it's a margin to divide your variables with different characteristics Okay, and then you decide this, based on formulation how to divide this, this, uh, mm -hmm. this, this group of respect. observations. Interest. I was interested in the lesson. We can barely hear you, Federica. Yeah, we can. Yeah. It's a really loud TV or uh, radio in the background. <laughs> whatever's in the background is super loud. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe in the chat. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's see. Right. Um, again, the N2 is two kernel functions, right? So, uh, feature space, which I think Jonathan was talking about. It's implicit, which to me, that's kind of like a mind, a little bit of a mind uh, bender, right? And infinite dimensional. Um, we couldn't do the computation in such a space anyway. So they're a little bit hand wavy about. I. I there's a part of me that wishes, obviously we've had a lot of questions about it today about implications of these formulas and how they all fit together. There's a part of me that wishes that they went into a little more detail about things because I think it might have resulted in a little bit better understanding. On the other hand, perhaps uh, the mathematics, I'm sure are very um, high level, right? So perhaps that was their decision to be a little bit hand wavy about it. I don't know about what the what the author's thought process was, but that was something I noticed going through this chapter very and then watching the uh, watching the the videos, which I would recommend. I mean, I think there the videos the, there's four videos that you can watch um, and they go onto it into some of this. I wouldn't say it gets a lot deeper, maybe a little bit but not a whole lot deeper than what's in the book. So there's my two cents. Going, going back just a little bit, I have a, just had a thought about what those dotted lines represent in the radial kernel case. Sure. It's, it's probably related somehow to the standard deviation of the Gaussian that's used for the radial kernel. The radial kernel. I, I'm sure it's proportional to that in some way. Like it's showing the, it's giving some indication of the, the sphere of influence of each. I mean, it's not it's not perfectly that because it's a combination from the contributions to all the points, but I really don't think it's like a hard cutoff line. It's just kind of like the the standard deviation of a of a Gaussian or normal curve. It just gives a sense of the width, but it's not a sharp edge to it. It's just some measure of how broad it is. I think that's probably what's going on there. And, and I looked in the book, they don't explain those dotted lines at all. They don't, <laughs> which again, that's my yeah, That's one so. of my complaints is that I'm not saying they needed to go through all the mathematics of it. It's probably outside the scope of the ISLR, probably more of an elements question, but at least saying, okay, this is clearly not as intuitive as, you know, <laughs> even this, which is still, you know, maybe not as intuitive as the, the linear case, right? Yeah, the left-hand plot, I think, also has, has its interesting features, like the lines there, like the margins. But for the right-hand plot, I'm guessing that the gamma parameter in the kernel function would change where those dotted lines are drawn. We go back to the gamma parameter. Um, yeah, it probably would, right? Because that's going to, uh, the like gamma parameter the is going to yeah. change kind of that, that uh, how how much we you know consider the effect of these these differences right exactly so that's interesting i uh, appreciate your thoughts about that okay so maybe there's an islr3 we can petition to talk about radial kernels a little bit more at least theoretical depth <laughs> Okay, so last learning objective, right, is two, more than two classes. They really didn't go into a lot of, it was more, there was two, I would say, paragraphs about this in the book. So um, it doesn't naturally extend to more than two classes, this concept of separating hyper, 
excuse me, separating hyperplanes, which is basically at the root of everything we've been talking about today. So a one, there's two different approaches you can do. One versus one, right? We'll construct, construct K, choose two SVMs. K is the number of classes. So an observation is classified to e each of the K choose two classes. So the number of times it appears in each class is counted. So the Kth class, uh, somebody's putting something in the chat. Yeah, Sorry, probably is. Interrupt. Forgive me. Oh, no, no, it's fine. I, I want to make sure I'm keeping an eye on the chat so I can see if people are saying something. Yeah, it probably is. It's the one, I think they, I think we have it in the links at the top of the, the Slack channel for this book better club. Better reference those then. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's probably worth it to, I watched it because, you know, obviously with presenting, I wanted to make sure that <laughs> even though, yes, thank you, John. Um, I'm a certainly beginner on this that I had as good of an understanding as I reasonably could. So basically the kth class would be coded as plus one and then the, the not kth not kth class was coded as negative one, right? So you, the new observation is classified to the class for which it was most often assigned in the pairwise classifications. Um, and if you don't have like a ton of uh, classes or you know, basically it's not gonna be as computationally expensive, you might choose that approach. Another option to kind of get around this limitation of two classes is the one versus all. Uh, so you have K SVMs are fitted. So one of the um, K classes basically to the remaining K minus one. Um, so you have beta, your S, you have beta naught K up to P sub K are denoted the parameters that result from constructing the SVM. So you compare the K class again, coded as plus one to the other everybody else, which is negative one. Um, so you assign the test observation to class K for which that function, right? Uh, I think I'm gonna edit that. Just making notes here of things I'm going to edit before. Uh, yeah, I think I need to, uh, is the largest. That's 9.14. And let's see, is there anything else here? Nope, that's all the way through. And we have about eight minutes to spare. So any um, questions, comments, things that occurred to people that they didn't think about when we were going through it that they want to bring up? Typos, do you notice, other than the ones that you all have caught or that I have caught myself? I don't okay. have anything to add, uh, just that, you know, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It was it's an okay presentation. I was trying to digest it myself and Sunday afternoon furiously be like, <laughs> okay, finish watching these videos, like throw this together, but like, you know, trying to get enough detail, but I don't, I'm not trying to recreate the book, right? Hopefully right. you all are reading the book, so, or watching the videos or both. Yeah, I do want to um, point out again that those videos are pinned in mm -hmm. the ISLR channel on the Slack and they're super useful. Um, so I do recommend those if you, you know, want to dive in some more. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, hopefully you're all well positioned to go over the lab next week. I'm going to be traveling, so I probably will not join. Um, but yeah, I think after we, because the videos only cover up through chapter 10, right? Because that was the original, the first edition was up through chapter 10. So right. good luck to everyone who's doing something beyond chapter 10. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is that fact. But there's right. a lot of good resources on the internet. So I'm sure you'll find other, other things to compensate. All right. Um, so on that note, um, does anyone want to volunteer to lead the lab? next week if not we can figure it out and you know the backup is always if if necessary i'll do it so um we'll talk about it in the channel but i will plan to do it otherwise i do think this is a good one to go through the lab because we had a lot of like application questions and it's always good to go through the lab number one but um i, I definitely think we should so uh we'll do that next week and uh, yeah, that's all I have. Anyone have any other thoughts before we end for the day? Give you back a few minutes. Uh, everyone had a lot of good ideas and was very smart. So I just wanted to say that the color is. Oh.
the other color is blue and mauve. Mauve. <laughs> so I just want to tell everybody you know that. That's actually something that Trevor Hasty or Trevor Hasty is very yeah. insistent on in those videos. He did. And he had a different pronunciation than I normally use. That was so when he said I was like, Mo, but maybe it's just my Midwestern pronunciation that's wrong. <laughs> well, he's from either Australia or New Zealand, so I'm pretty sure he's wrong. <laughs> we're gonna go with that right the american we do it right <laughs> not <laughs> all right well on that uh, i will see everyone next week bye bye bye